Washington Journal continues. Sam Quinones is a journalist and author of the 2015 book Dreamland, the true story of America's opiate epidemic, joins us today as we return to this topic of opioid addiction in America. But before we get to the book, I want to ask about something you wrote on your blog recently. Uh-huh. You said there, writing about heroin these days is really another way of writing about America, yeah. who we are and what we've become. Can you explain that? Sure. I began to, uh, this began to occur to me as I began to uh, write. It was in the middle of this project. And um, I began to wonder why it was that, uh, that this problem was really effect- was affecting Appalachia, but then also why it was affecting uh, Charlotte and South Salt Lake and Indianapolis and places that did very well over the last 20, 30 years, not Rust Belt areas at all. What was the common denominator? I began to kind of understand that, that um, the common denominator was our own isolation and that you were really writing about much bigger topics than simply drug trafficking. See, I got, I'm a, my background is as a crime reporter, and I thought I was writing a book about cr- drug trafficking from Mexico and marketing, pharmaceutical marketing and stuff. All of that's certainly part of this story. But I think um, beyond that, it gets into who we've become. We've become so isolated, fragmented. We've done enormous amounts to destroy community in this country. We've, uh, the Dr- Dreamland title comes from a, a swimming pool in, uh, in the town of Portsmouth, Ohio, on the, in southern Ohio, on the, on the Ohio River, that, uh, that uh, once it, uh, you know, once was the kind of the thing that held the town together. Everyone saw each other. That's where you grew up. It was this place where everyone came together and formed community, really. Obviously, it was sustained by jobs. It was sustained by a good downtown, a uh, 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 Main Street. But uh, uh, once that went away, once all that went away, it was like this savaging of the uh, societal immune system, left, left places very vulnerable. That took place in Rust Belt areas, this kind of destruction of community, but in, in, in wealthier areas, in, in, in suburban areas, everyone's so isolated. Our suburban uh, uh, community uh, 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 architecture is almost designed for that. Technology, while it connects us superficially, really does a lot to separate us. And so this, these were some of the reasons why I thought writing about heroin is actually writing about who we become as a country, as people. As we have this conversation this morning, want to ask our viewers to join in. If you've been affected uh, by opioid addiction, want to hear your stories this morning, please do call in uh, or send us a, a tweet as well. 202-748-8000 is the number. If you want to call in, uh, you can tweet uh, at C-SPAN WJ. If you're a medical professional, Phone number for you this morning, 202-748-8001. All others do want you to join the conversation as well, 202-748-8002. You you mentioned Dreamland uh, Dreamland in in Portsmouth, Ohio. What should viewers know about uh, Nayarit, Mexico? Uh, Yes, part of my book deals with the, the guys who first figured out the heroin traffickers who first figured out that this a very aggressive push to promote a pain pill prescribing among doctors and them buy, doctors buying into that idea would eventually lead to a, heroin, a, a vast new heroin market. And the guys that I write about in my book were the ones who figured that out and, and saw that first emerging in Columbus, Ohio and the areas around there, various cities around there, Cincinnati, uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, places like that. Uh, these guys had developed a system by then. They developed in the West Coast, uh, where all, the, all the, the markets that they broke into eventually had a static number of addicts. Uh, so they, and they were all from the same town. There was all this, this one town in particular, I think it was, played a very important role on this, in this. The name of the town is Jalisco. It's in the state of Nayarit. And these guys figured out uh, a, a, a retail model of selling heroin by the tenth of a gram, very much similar to pizza delivery. So you'd call, you'd order, they, they'd send a driver to, to deliver uh, hits of heroin uh, to, to you near, near where you, where you live. These guys, with their model, initially developed it on the western side of the United States, where the number of addicts were static. They become master marketers. They couldn't kill each other because we're all from the same town. They know where, you, where each other's mothers live. When they compete, they couldn't really eliminate the, the, the competition the way people in the underworld traditionally have, dating back to Al Capone, really. So they had to become master marketers, and that's what they became. And it was a way of 
discounting, giving dope away free in front of methadone clinics, giving dope away free to guys who get, just got out of jail. You bring me uh, five new customers, I give you 50 free balloons of heroin, that kind of thing. Their, their key moment comes when they jump the Mississippi River for the first time. One guy in particular I talked to in the book, jump the Mississippi River, land in Columbus just as a massive new push is underway by pharmaceutical companies and pain specialists, particularly in the area of southern Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, to promote uh, narcotic painkillers, Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycontin, as the new solution to pain. This creates a whole new number, a huge new number of, of addicts, and they are there to then service those addicts once they can no longer afford those pills and are looking for something cheaper. So you've got the, the story of, of towns like Portsmouth, Ohio. You've got the drug traffickers, and, and you just mentioned it. What should viewers know about Purdue Pharma? <clears throat> uh, Purdue Pharma was crucial in forming what we have today. Primarily, I would say OxyContin was crucial. The drug that Purdue Pharma makes uh, is, was crucial in, in, in all this. First of all, for two reasons. One was that Purdue Pharma uh, used a, 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 a very aggressive form of marketing to doctors, giveaways, very similar to the, the marketing techniques that the Jalisco boys from Nayarit used to sell their heroin. Purdue Pharma used to, to um, convince doctors that these pills were no longer addictive, particularly OxyContin was no longer addictive, and they, they'd, be, they'd be fine uh, prescribing it to their, their patients. Uh, and they, they gave away stuff. They don't do this anymore, but for, for seven years of the drug's life, they gave away stuff, trips. Uh, they gave away a little CD called Swing in the Right Direction with OxyContin, uh, where, uh, where we've got some swing band tunes. That, that was a, it was a very aggressive, constant kind of marketing to doctors to convince them that this was fine to do. And then also, um, OxyContin was a crucial part of this because OxyContin did not contain any abuse deterrent for the first 14 years of his life. So it took addicts, people would get addicted and it would take their, their tolerance up to very, very high levels. And then they would be looking for a cheap, potent alternative. And heroin proved to be that, that particularly the heroin initially from, from Jalisco Nayarit proved to be that, the, the crucial uh, uh, alternative and all that. As I show viewers this chart of drug overdose deaths from 1980 to 2016, rising to somewhere between 59,000 to 65,000 people right. in the United States uh, in 2016. When is your story that you talk about in this book taking place? What years is this uh, happening? I would it? say the mid-90s to, uh, I turned the book in in 2014, and about those, those years, I would say, where, where you're seeing, uh, and then of course, you know, it's interesting, uh, when I was writing the book, I'm a longtime crime reporter, and I kind of knew that the, the, the most uh, uh, innovative and quick, fast-changing part of our economy is the underworld. It's always morphing into something new. I kind of knew that, that part of the story would just continue to, to evolve and morph as I got, as the book came, after the book came out, and that's also what's, what's happened with, um, with the emergence of fentanyl as, a, as an additive to, to, to the drugs people are using. And the book is Dreamland, the True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. The author, Sam Quinones, here with us uh, for the next 45 minutes to take your questions and comments. Mm -hmm. Dave is up first in Denver, Colorado, on that line for those who's, who've been affected by opioids. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, yes, this is Dave over in Denver, Colorado. Yeah, Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Yes, and I, I hear every day how we're treating my granddaughter is an addict and it's heart-wrenching and breaking. But every day we talk about solutions. Oh, we're going to put them on this drug or that drug or this. When, when you hear it on C-SPAN, they talk about uh, how they're getting all the states where marijuana is legal, suicides have dropped 30%. Overdoses have dropped 30%. You never hear them mention that. It's always, you know... Uh, when, when they're scared to face that that that, that marijuana is a cure, and, and they they just don't want to admit it. And I Sam, can you just give you a chance to talk about that? Uh, Dave, yes, I'm sorry to hear about your granddaughter. Um, I know this this is a story that's going on across the country, and it's a crushing uh, torture to to so so many families all all across the country. I think that there are early signs that maybe this is one way of of transitioning people off opioids medical marijuana. I think we've, we've rushed into medical marijuana a little bit, though. I think, I think we need to be uh, a little bit more cautious and humble 
uh, about about uh, the the potential uses uh, uh, of this, and in, in fact, the potential f uh, what 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 might happen should we legalize marijuana? Certainly, all kinds of marijuana uh, nationwide. I mean, marijuana varies widely nowadays. Uh, very different from when. Uh, I was a kid in, and grown up in Southern California. Marijuana was very mild uh, back then. Now it's extraordinarily intense. There's also a big uh, question of what kind of marijuana actually is good for medical uh, purposes. The, the ma marijuana that makes you most high with THC, uh, very high levels of THC, which is the element that makes you high in, in marijuana, um, from my reading, is not always the, the one that contains all the medical uh, benefits. So it's the CBD uh, elements in, in, uh, in marijuana that actually are what, what keep, uh, what, what have the medical benefits. But, uh, but uh, and so I, I would be cautious, given what I wrote about here, which is that uh, a massive amount of legal drugs was unleashed on the country to very great uh, and dire uh, nightmarish consequences. I think it's, it's also worth keep that keeping, keeping that in mind as well, uh, as far as marijuana is concerned. To Windsor Mill, Maryland. Warren is a medical professional. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I have um, a question I, I want to ask the gentleman over there, and I would like him to address three um, areas for me. Um, the first area is uh, poverty. Can you please um, explain how poverty plays a big role in this system, especially when it comes to rural areas and urban areas? I, I live in Baltimore, but I work in Washington, D.C., and I work in this population. The other area I want you to um, address is the easy availability of prescription drugs. If you walk through the streets of Baltimore and um, you walk through the streets of uh, Washington, D.C. and areas, you can get Parkosets and different prescription pain killers just in the streets. You know, you can right. get them for $5, $10, you know, they just everywhere. Yes. And three, the big one is the criminal justice system. This one, I think needs to be addressed because a lot of these people go to jail for different things and when they come out they can't find jobs and because these records and whatever they accumulate from drugs or whatever situation keep following them and as a result you create a population we cannot find jobs and resort to those same measures they go back into using drugs because they get frustrated and depressed and we have to deal with these situations every day and so Martin, can there before, be a way that we can address this before the ahead, before Sam Kenyon just addresses your question, what kind of medical professional are you? I'm a mental health counselor, and I also have a degree in addiction. Appreciate okay. the questions. Okay, I mean that's a definitely those are huge questions, um, and I thank you for bringing up. Uh, I would say first of all, this this has certainly started in Rust Belt slash poverty uh, 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 stricken areas. Uh, in rural areas, primarily Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, Eastern Tennessee, Western Pennsylvania, those areas, that's kind of my, very roughly drawn. That would be my ground zero, if you like. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, I, I think those were areas that were ripe for this. There was a lot of places where doctors had become solutions, not just to people's physical pain, but to their uh, economic pain as well. They were way, doctors were the people you had to go to if you wanted to get workers' comp or SSDI, uh, so Security Disability Insurance, Supplemental Disability Insurance. Uh, SSI is, is another one that you needed a doctor to sign off on. And these were areas where the doctors were already acutely aware of the pain people were suffering physically but as well uh, uh, economically. And I think that that was one of the reasons why pharmaceutical companies uh, went to those areas first and promoted in those areas first because they saw that these were areas where doctors were already prescribing a, a lot of pills and were already kind of amenable to this approach and, th and that they were very uh, ac acutely aware of how, how bad things were, 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 were in, in these areas. I would say, however, it's important to understand today that that is not always the case. Mostly, I would say, it's in, in, in well-to-do suburbs where you're finding this problem. This is not necessarily, this is not only Rust Belt areas, Appalachia. This is, again, Charlotte, North Carolina, Salt Lake, uh, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, all over the country. Um, the common denominator is not economics. It is, I believe, uh, one common, uh, common denominator is um, race. Uh, while it's, it's common and, and it's true to say that drugs do not discriminate, um, this is almost entirely a white person's problem. And very rarely that you find 
a, a large number of, of, now Baltimore may be a, 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 an exception to that rule, but across the country you're finding mostly, mostly white people, Native Americans too, to, to a certain degree as well. Um, I would say in answer to your, your other question, um, yes, this is a supply generated problem. I, I used to believe when I lived in Mexico that uh, demand was the problem, that we create, our demand here created, a, created a, uh, the, 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 the motivation for people to sell drugs uh, from Mexico. I now believe actually something very different from this book. I really believe that the crucial detonator of these problems is supply, excess supply. And that's what we had when, we, when doctors across the country came to believe the idea that, per, first of all, these pills were non-addictive when used to treat pain, Therefore, it didn't matter how many of these pills they prescribed, and, and, and for 20 years plus now, uh, all kinds of uh, surgery, chronic pain, et cetera, ma ma mainly acute surge of pain after surgery, has been uh, uh, massively uh, overprescribed. And so these pills now are circulating uh, everywhere. There's a lot of ways in which these pills have leaked out into the, into the black market, but what you're seeing in Baltimore and other places is kind of an effect of that, a result of that. The book is Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. Uh, Sam Quinones is the author. Why are you in D.C.? Today. I'm here uh, to speak uh, at the invitation of the Faith and Politics Institute, uh, uh, speaking uh, and privately with some uh, congressional staffers, Senate staffers, and then at 7 p.m. tonight in the Capitol Visitor Center, 7 p.m. I think is the time, uh, a public talk, a panel with a couple of congressmen and, and senators, and just on this very issue, which is so important uh, nationwide now. A busy day. Appreciate you taking the time with oh, us and pleasure. our callers. Margaret is in Carryville, Texas. That line for all others. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm coming towards this in a different way. I probably call it a cultural way. I'm an 89 year old, and I see that um, so much in our life now uh, we 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 are projected with the image that any pain or discomfort, whether it's physical or mental, is unnatural. Whether we need to take something to get rid of that. Um, I used to be a competitive runner, for example, and I know the difference between discomfort and pain, but a lot of people don't. They seem to think any little discomfort in their life is so unnatural, you've got to take something to get rid of it. And uh, I seldom watch cable TV. And last Sunday, I was watching an hour program. Every intermission when they had ads, there were three or four ads um, that gave the image of uh, happiness being without pain, without discomfort. And if you have any of the, if you have either of these, you better take something to get rid of it. You go to the doctor and yeah. you find. You ask the doctor for a certain kind of medicine, so you will not feel discomfort. Now, I could go on and on with this, but I'm not going to, of course. But this, to me, is one of the big things yeah. in our life. Margaret, sure. thanks for bringing it up. Uh, absolutely. And you were asking earlier, John, about how this is a, a reflective of... Uh, of larger issues, cultural issues, I think, in our country. And I think what uh, Margaret brings up is just exact one of those points, is that we as a culture ha grew uh, uh, to fear pain. Uh, you know, you can see this in all parts of life. Well, we're afraid of letting our kids go outside, afraid of letting them skin their knees. So we're afraid that they might, might feel some emotional pain from not being chosen the best player on the team. So we give away trophies for, for, uh, to everybody. Uh, it's it's part of our, our culture now. We, we we treat our bodies, I think, frequently like um, cars. And doctors, we use them as car mechanics. You go to the doc, you say, uh, fix me. And frequently, I think you can hear doctors' stories very very uh, vividly on these on this point. Frequently, when the doc says, well, the problem is you need to work out. You don't. You need to eat better. You need to quit smoking. Walk more. Swim more. Whatever. A variety of things are really require us, our responsible, uh, we need to be responsible and our own, uh, we need to, to have an, a, a, a look at our own wellness. Uh, they're, they're, they're approaching it that way. We, frequently the, um, our, our response is, well, no doc, that's not my job, that's your job to fix me. And, and I think all across our culture today, you're seeing this kind of way of 
no one's outside. Why? Because there's a certain anxiety parents have about letting their kids go outside alone. And my child molester is behind every tree, I suppose, they're, they're imagining. We, we fear, we, we, we have hyper-protected our kids to the point uh, uh, to, to in, 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 in our effort to get them to avoid pain. And I think really we have we have, we have uh, deformed these kids in a, in a lot of ways. They are not prepared to, to uh, maybe work hard at something and, um, and just deal with the common ordinary pain that you might feel just, by, uh, just, just through living life. To Ventura, California, Melanie has been impacted uh, by opioid ad- abuse. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I live in Ventura, California, and I have chronic pain, and I'm very debilitated. And I depend on my medication because it's not just a little bit of pain. It's a huge amount of pain. I don't abuse. I go to my doctor regularly, and they're cutting back a lot. I understand there's a drug addiction problem, but why us, the ones that are in critical care, getting cut off because of the abusers? That's my question. Number two, how come nobody's addressing the methamphetamine problem that we have that seems to be more outrageous than the opiate addiction. Um, With regard to your first uh, question or your first comment, um, yes, I mean, I I think one of the reactions, again, we we, we seem to have a trouble finding that, letting the pendulum kind of ease into the middle uh, somewhere. And um, there are people who need, like you, I I, I hear, uh, uh, who need these, these pills, who need these drugs. Um, and therefore um, uh, should not be kind of cut off peremptorily. Uh, this is unfortunately what's been happening in, in some areas. It's, it's, but it, it's, it seems like we can kind of go from one extreme to the other. We either pre- uh, 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 heavily, massively prescribe these things or we want to just cut them off in, entirely. And I would say that there's a, 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 a role for really nuanced medicine here and, and getting back to, again, that, that kind of community care, the, the way the doctor and the patient kind of worked together to find a solution to each patient's pain. Very, very important uh, uh, to practice medicine that way, it seems to me, although I'm not a, a doctor. What about to her second point that the meth addiction in this country she thinks is worse than heroin? I, 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 well, it's, it's true that there is a, a serious problem with meth addiction and meth use in, in America. Um, I, don't think methamphetamine is is to to blame for 59,000 deaths uh, annually. That is not uh, possible. Um, it, it's it's a it's a gruesome drug. It's a, a torturous drug, and I wish it on on nobody. Um, and but yeah, I don't know that it's actually at this point uh, um, the the preeminent threat. Zach from Minneapolis, uh, affected by opioid abuse. Go ahead, Zach. Yes, I just want to say. Everybody that I know who abuses them starts from the doctor. Uh, they go into the doctor, they have a backache, um, you know, they have a shoulder pain, and they get prescribed oxycodone. And then before you know it, they need more. Uh, you know, they're lying, they're stealing. Um, it's really a gateway to heroin abuse, and then because heroin is cheaper, so I've noticed they'll go out and buy heroin. And I noticed you mentioned marijuana earlier in a conversation, and you know, nobody's ever. Uh, overdosed on marijuana. Nobody's ever stolen to get money for marijuana. Nobody's ever sold their body to get money. I mean, it's really, you know, marijuana is not the gateway to opioid abuse. It's the physicians. Yes, I think I would, I would agree with that. I think uh, 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 doctors have over-prescribed and very, very aggressively prescribed for 20 plus years now. And, and that has created um, a lot of people who uh, doctors and dentists, I would say. Dentists, for example, uh, prescribe a, a huge amounts of these drugs for uh, after wis- wis- uh, wisdom tooth extraction, for example. Uh, that, to me, um, feels bizarre, honestly. Uh, uh, so I would say absolutely, absolutely right. It's, it's one re- what, what you're talking about is one reason why I think football is a gateway to heroin addiction because football is one of those sports, the, the, the sport that creates most injury, I think. And, and when you deal with injury through just uh, firing uh, pills at it, 
Uh, eventually, lots of kids will, or lots of people, football players, will get addicted. I think that's what you've seen all, all across all across the country. It's a very, uh, it's it's a it's a serious problem. I would say what's what the, the only difference today is that in the last couple of years, this has actually gotten the attention it deserves. We've been we've been watching this fester for 20 years now, and it's now last two years that it's actually been a big deal. On that point, I want to come to uh, the story of. Daniel Wolanski that you wrote about in your book from Avon Lake, Ohio. It was his obituary, and mm-hmm. his parents uh, mentioned his son's battle with opioid right. addiction. Uh, here it is from page 347 of your book. While noting their son's comical and charismatic personality, the parents of the 24-year-old, 24-year-old wrote that, unfortunately, his five-year battle with addiction took over and eventually beat him, though he spoke often before he died of the many friends that he'd lost to overdoses. They say it takes a community to raise a child, his parents wrote. It takes a community to battle addiction. Well, I want you to talk about the, the, the parents talking about yes, this addiction and how you, that changed. Yes, absolutely. When I was writing this book, what stunned me was the lack of the, the, the enormous silence, the lack of willingness to talk about this. Uh, I had grown up during the crack years as a reporter. That was my first job. I really was covering crack cocaine in, in a town in California, Stockton, California. Uh, when I, uh, uh, and back then, you, it really was not hard. People would come to you, hey, write about our neighborhood. It's under siege. There's gangs, there's drug tra- there's, uh, uh, traffickers, there's uh, drive-by shooting. With this story, I was stunned because... Um, I could not find, it was very difficult to find parents who wanted to talk about this. This was not so long ago, 2013, 2014, it was on the, when I was in the middle of all this. And I would go to them and, and, and they, would, but they would tell me maybe off the record, oh, please don't print that, don't write anything. And, and this is one of the reasons it spread, and, and it is because people who most could, could ignite interest, which would be parents who have this poignant, lacerating story to tell that, that only they really can tell, uh, weren't telling it, did not want to, were, were actively trying to hide it, would make up in the obituaries, uh, you know, died of a heart attack, died suddenly at home. Uh, it was very much like the AIDS epidemic, you remember back in the mid-80s where, where people didn't, would make up lies for the obituary, fabricate things for the obituary. What has changed in the last two years is really has ignited interest in this topic, I believe, is that parents now have found kind of common cause. They're, they're coming out of the shadows to talk about this in a very uh, uh, open way and tell the story in the way only a, a grieving parent can. And in the media, I'm in the media for 30 years now, uh, I, I know the power uh, of that. And, 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 uh, and that's what's really... Um, that's what's changed, I would say, in the last in the last few. Now you're seeing that kind of obituary. I put them up on my Facebook account all the time because I want to encourage those parents. I think it's healthy for them not to sit in a room crying and, and just being all alone, but it's also healthy for the country. To Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Bob is a medical professional. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the question I have, do you know how big a uh, Duclux tablet is? And that much could kill two or three people if that was fentanyl. So you can get a rough idea on how small a dose of fentanyl can be destructive. That is what they are putting in to heroin. Right. And here it is like uh, 50 to 100 times more addicting than regular heroin. The ones who make that fentanyl, and it's coming from Mexico, mix it with the heroin, oh, this will be more addicting, and they'll buy more from us. Hit it at the price. If they are selling it, then let them be responsible. If they have made money on it, take everything away. They can never own anything in the United States. Well, uh, yeah, getting to the point of fentanyl, this is absolutely true. Um, Fentanyl is a whole new wrinkle that is extraordinarily scary. It's scary for users. Um, It's scary for for family members, of course, because uh, the death toll is really largely due uh, to, to fentanyl now, I think. 
It's also a very dangerous for law enforcement, for EMS, who have to deal with folks who are overdosing or maybe in drug busts or whatever. They don't, they don't know what, to, uh, what is and what isn't uh, fentanyl, and it's, it's a very dangerous for those folks uh, as well. I uh, think about them a lot, I have to say. Um, yes, and, and, but you, you think in fentanyl in terms of the, just the last wrinkle, the latest wrinkle in, in the underworld uh, as, it, as it is at, re- adapted to our overprescribing of these pills. First it was, um, first it was a, a black market in these pills uh, that you could sell for a dollar a milligram, and these pills were going for uh, you know, 40, 80 milligrams uh, each. Um, uh, then, uh, of course, not too long after that, heroin, uh, from Mexico, uh, all of this uh, heroin comes from Mexico nowadays. A- and None then, of it comes from, from Afghanistan? That's a, a question no, our viewers a, have asked that, on this program That's before. a myth. The, the, the Afghanistan is too far away. Think of it in terms of a business. You cannot bring over huge amounts of heroin from Afghanistan, uh, what's that, 8,000 miles away or something like that, and, and have it compete with heroin brought by very efficient traffickers from Mexico, very good at their job, very good at production uh, from a few hundred or a couple thousand miles away. Just business-wise, it just cannot, cannot compete. It's got to cross a, a continent and an ocean. Mexico's right there. And so our, all our heroin, 90%, I think, is the figure plus uh, comes from, from Mexico. Fentanyl is simply the latest wrinkle in a group from, a, from an underworld that does not care. Uh, basically. And so adding fentanyl is opiate without a plant. You don't have to have a a group of laborers who know how to harvest opium goo and then cook it into heroin. It's very quick. It's very easy, very cheap, and extraordinarily profitable, of course. And that's why fentanyl is now on the scene. To Appalachia, Caneyville, Kentucky. Ken has been impacted by this. Go ahead. Yeah, I was talking one of your previous callers. I want to agree with what she said about the people that need these and use them. I'm in my 70s. I had to retire earlier than I would have liked to. I'd done heavy manual labor all my life. I had back injuries. I took them as I needed them. It was the only time I took them. Well, you can't do that anymore. If you go in and they take and do a urine test and blood test, if you ain't got the level through the roof, then you're cut off. There's too many people that use these, and now they said, I got a letter from my doctor I took, on top of the back trouble that I've had, I've been dealing with colon cancer now for five years. I'm the major caretaker of four of my grandchildren, and now my doctor sent me a letter last week that I'm being cut off. I'll have to go to a pain management center. That's a hundred and something mile trip that I'll have to make and stay all day, and they'll put me through the ropes on they want to stick needles in your back and go this way and new MRIs and all that, and it's a money thing. I can't understand, and they holler opioid epidemic. Most of the people you see out here dead are young people with a needle hanging out of their arm. Why going after the people in their 70s and all that have worked all their life and need this stuff now to function, normally function, don't stay, I'm not stoned. I never do that. I've never had a problem in my life with drugs, alcohol, or nothing. But now I need the drugs now to survive. Right, and, and, and I think this is part, part of the problem that we face. We have a kind of a distorted medical world where where we have um, where, where 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 drugs have been been the answer used as as the answer, and so the answer mo- when when it, when they also create a problem, very severe problem. I, I, I'm quite sure you know lots of people in the, in the in in your area who have grown addicted to these pills, and from then from there gone and got addicted to to heroin. That doesn't change your problem, I understand, but but. But the, 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 the problem is we, we, medicine has kind of become used to just firing pills at things. Doesn't, it's got to learn, I think, doctors have to learn how to, how to find that nuance, how to find that middle, middle road so that they can work with you personally over a period of time to find the proper, the proper approach to, to, to your pain and maybe those pills are a big, are a big part of it. I don't, I don't know, but I think we've kind of gotten away from from that, the, the way medicine, I think, many years ago used to be practiced, which was a more personal way, where, where individual traits and individual background were taken into consideration. We were not treated as kind of a, a production line of, of patients. The House expected to come in in about 20 minutes this morning. We'll, of course, take our viewers there for gavel-to-gavel coverage. 
a lot of interest today in the wake uh, of Republicans in the Senate abandoning their health care bill. We'll so certainly be watching for that. Uh, but until the House comes in, taking your calls, uh, Sam Quinonez with us, author of Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. Christian is also in Kentucky, Lexington. Line for all others. Go ahead. Hey, Sam. Uh, great discussion today. Thank you for this. Um, a couple of questions for you. Um, I live next door to a notorious pill mill um, dealer. His name is Ali Sawaf. I don't know okay. if you read about him, but you can you can check him out. I, I sent you a tweet. Um, how many pill mills are there in America today? And you know, I don't know the number. I can't wait to read your book. Um, but what you know, I can tell you, having somebody like Ali Sawaf in my neighborhood, and we live in a very nice neighborhood in a beautiful city. Mm-hmm. Um, the police have told me this is in every neighborhood in America. You know, it, as you're oh. saying, it's it, it's not just you know poor. It's not just you know oh. p- places where you would you would you know you might fear it would be. This is in you know million dollar home neighborhoods, sure. and the police and the police say unless he's you know you see him carrying twenty pounds of heroin, there's nothing they can do. Right. Yeah. I, I would say the pill mill thing began with our overprescribing of pain pills. Uh, the pain, pill mills are essentially um, pain management clinics in which the doctor has uh, uh, abandoned or never did install any, any reasonable kind of diagnosis. It's just a manner of, of selling prescriptions for cash. Uh, first began in the area, the Ground Zero area I was talking about, uh, you know, in, in southern Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky. Uh, I write a lot about in the book about, about the guy who really invented that business model in Portsmouth, Ohio. Uh, that then spreads to other areas. Florida was very, very big in this for, for through the mid-2000s. Um, now what you're seeing, I think, is, is not so many of the most outrageous pill mills as used to be where you have like long lines and people from out of state and people dressed in pajamas just there to get their dope and their prescription and move on. Um, I think what you're finding is the, that a lot of doctors have kind of succumbed. And this is the problem. These pills were sold as a boon to doctors. This will take care of your greatest problem, uh, which are, are pain patients who take a lot of your time. It turned out really to be a curse. A lot of doctors saw their scruples kind of withered away over time and them facing insistent patients every day, day in, day out, demanding these drugs. Uh, they got used to the cash. And, and what you find now is, is sporadic uh, uh, doctors popping up here and there all across the country. Uh, I think bar- fairly isolated cases, but nevertheless real problems for where they, they live, where they're just way over prescribing and people start getting very addicted or, and in, 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 in a lot of cases uh, 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 dying. It's gone are the days of kind of the Wild West uh, uh, pill mills in in in, uh, in in Appalachia, I think, but they still exist and they they pop up uh, occasionally all across the country. And it's a doctor who has kind of lost his way, uh, honestly, with this and become addicted to the cash. Jin with a question on Twitter: Where was the concern for the crack e- epidemic besides locking users up? Uh, yeah, a good question. Uh, I was a crime reporter during the crack epidemic. I have some some history to compare. Um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, this is largely a white epidemic right now. And because of that, because whites are the down, dominant uh, racial group in this country, that has affected the political discourse. A lot of people are getting affected. They, they are contacting their state legislators, their mayors, their, their congressmen. And this is having a political, uh, a, a political effect. And they have a political power, frankly, just speaking very bluntly, that blacks do not have. Um, and that is what has created, I would say especially interestingly, in red areas, uh, radical changes in how this, this is, a, is being approached. So now it's no longer throw away the key, lock them up forever, that kind of thing. It's, it's an approach to addiction uh, that involves treatment. Uh, we need to treat these folks. We need to install drug courts so they don't have a felony record. Now, none of this was proposed back in the, in the crack epidemic 25, 30, 30 years ago. There's one, however, one big difference. Uh, between this epidemic uh, and that one, um, well, two, two. One is that, that um, back then, most of the dealers that I saw were, were black. Uh, most of the, the users were, were of every race. I can tell you in Stockton, California, there was user, crack users of every, every race. But, um, uh, uh, and, and this one is almost entirely white people. It's just so intensely uniracial. It's very interesting for that reason, I think, very strange. But 
The other big difference is that there was, during the crack epidemic, a massive epidemic as well of public violence, drive-by shootings, carjackings, bullets whizzing through. I covered this all the time for four years. In my town, there was record homicide levels uh, 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 every, every year that I was uh, in Stockton uh, covering this, this problem. So therefore, the focus was on, on incarceration, I think. That's one of the reasons there was a very heavily a focus. The black community was very intent on getting the police to get rid of these dealers who were all over their, their, their neighborhoods. Um, there was no focus that I can remember on, on building new treatment, on expanding treatment capacity, any, any of that. Fast forward to today, we have none of the public violence that was associated with crack. I would say that it would be very hard for me to, to imagine this problem getting the kind of focus on treatment approach that we're seeing now if there was also the same kind of level of violence that we saw during the crack years. That, that people who lived through that can remember just how, how what, a, what a plague of locusts that, that was. The crime problem was awful. And that's a major way this differs between what happened before. New Rochelle in New York. Carmine, uh, line for all others. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. Mr. Quinones, you really touched on something. Uh, this is about 15 years ago. I was told by a doctor that NFL doctors were refusing to write prescriptions for powerful painkillers. Reason being, it was their tremendous concern for the health and well-being of their patients who were NFL players. And a lot of it had to do with valuable players playing through injury during a game. And that I remember he concentrated on the running backs that were particularly beaten up in a vicious game that were given tremendous amounts of painkillers to play through injury. Right. You really hit the nail on the head, sir. Uh, thank you. Yes, what, what, what struck me, I have to say, is that football was such a, a gateway. Uh, one of the stories I write about in the book is the University of Akron team, 2009, that, that basically disintegrated under the, under the pressure of needing to win because there was a, the school had just uh, built a new stadium. And then also uh, the first string uh, uh, getting hurt, uh, the second stringers weren't really up to the job, and, and so there was a lot of pressure to get these guys back on. And a culture of using pain pills to deal with pain and get people back playing again quickly uh, basically uh, destroyed, destroyed that team. Half the team, uh, according to guys on the team that I talked to, uh, got addicted. A quarterback eventually died of a heroin overdose. One of the cornerbacks, uh, a son of a friend of mine uh, from Ohio, uh, also died of a heroin overdose. I mean, this, this has affected sports, uh, uh, high school and college sports uh, massively, if you ask me. Uh, football is the, the extreme example, but you also find this in wrestling, lacrosse, baseball, and, uh, and other, other sports. To Glendale, Missouri. Paul, affected by opioid abuse. Go ahead. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, uh, just a comment and a question for Mr. Quinones. Um, I, I've suffered from chronic pain for decades due to uh, work-related injuries yeah. uh, uh, and also have been impacted by the opioid epidemic uh, with the loss of a family member. Uh, I'm sorry. To overdose. This is a very complicated problem, but as a, as a uh, chronic pain sufferer, I want to ask Mr. Quinone if he's ever personally... Uh, suffered from extreme pain. Uh, has he ever, for instance, experienced a ruptured disc? Uh, no, I had a hernia when I was an infant. That was it. And, and Paul, uh, go ahead, finish your, finish your comment. Any, I, it has not been my personal experience over decades of doctors pushing uh, painkillers. Far, far from it. Now, I know there are doctors out there doing this. That's obvious. But it has not been my personal experience. And mm -hmm. just to echo what a previous caller uh, called in to say, uh, you cannot get a prescription for a controlled substance from a general practitioner anymore. They will not prescribe controlled substances anymore. If you, have, if you suffer from degenerative disc disease, 
if you have, have a history of decades of back surgeries and nerve damage and you suffer from another event, you're out of luck, buddy. Yeah. You, Again, I think, I think this, is, this is part of the problem we face as, as a country, this inability to find that happy middle ground where people, but I think what it comes from is that, that our, our system uh, it, it has this kind of production line quality to it where no one's really treated with the time and the, the attention uh, that, the, uh, that they need, or not a lot of people are. And, and so this is, I think what, what the caller is referring to is is uh, is a result of part of, part of that the doctors overall are just saying no i'm not going to prescribe any of these pills these pills are magnificent tools they can be it's just how you how you use them the other the, the the flip side of that is when you go in as i did for an appendix operation and uh you're given uh when you leave uh for pain that's going to last two days you're given 30 days worth of painkiller uh, that those days may be coming to an end slowly. I still think a lot of doctors still do this, but um, but that's that's the other uh, that's the opposite end, and that's why an earlier call, caller said, "Well, we can find these pills on the street for five bucks." Well, I still think that that's that's that that that's what's happening as well. You're seeing this, and I think it depends on on the doctor and and the region where you are. Really, about ten minutes left before the house comes in. We'll try to get to as many calls as we can. Debbie, Indianapolis, Indiana. Go ahead, medical professional line. Yes, I was just calling in. As a registered nurse, I think all of us that are health professionals kind of remember that another thing that hasn't been brought up was the Joint Commission of Hospitals accreditation, the JCHL. Right. Back 20 years ago, there was this huge um, impact on hospitals and providers that we were not adequately controlling acute pain. Now, this was acute pain, and there was a huge focus on prescribing and making sure that we were giving uh, patients medication they needed to be comfortable and, and that was also, I think, a contributing factor. So I don't blame uh, so many providers for the problem. I think there was a reaction to, yes. um, to patient satisfaction in a lot of these hospitals that started to precipitate these. And then you had providers that took advantage of those types of things, and a lot of these uh, pill mills would pop up afterwards for, for sure. Yes, and I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's exactly what, that, that there were enormous pressures on doctors to, to prescribe in this way. Um, and one of them was uh, Jayco coming out with its idea that pain was now to be called the fifth vital sign. Uh, pain is not a vital sign. A vital sign in medicine is something you cannot live with. You cannot live without a pulse. You can live with pain. Pain is really just not. But in order to get doctors to very aggressively look at pain and 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 uh, and, and, a, and attack the pain of a patient, always ask about the, the the Jayco came up with this idea along with some others, I think. And and it and it um, there were these pressures. There was this idea that if you were a doctor and not aggressively treating pain, that you were failing in your mission, that you could be sued, that you uh, the patient was given uh, uh, patient doctor evaluations, and if you got a bad evaluation. The doctor could then, if a doctor got a bad patient evaluation or too many of them, could be uh, uh, really affected economically in some way. There were these pressures that pushed doctors in that way. A lot of doctors had learned in, in, in med school that these pills were highly addictive. Getting over that, pushing them over that hump, getting over that objection uh, took a long time. But, it, but in the end, marketing, marketing worked. And, um, and so this is where we are. Uh, we have push that pendulum from, from we should never ever use these pills for any reason, which I didn't think was a good idea either, to we use them for, for massively and, and frequently for, for pain that, that, that has long since ceased to exist. And, and that's, that's, it's finding that middle uh, ground, I think, that is, is the tricky question. To New England, Orleans, Massachusetts, Catherine has been impacted by this. Go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to touch on a couple things quickly because I know you're running out of time. When um, the uh, comment was made that parents and family members need to get involved, uh, my mother committed suicide. Um, and when the police chief called me up and said that when they looked into her with her doctor records that she was given high, extremely high doses of antidepressants and davisets and he said that um, it was like the doctor just put the bullet in her, the gun uh -huh. and to tell you I was so shocked that um, I was in shock we were all in shock and um, 
not that she was sick. There were multiple, multiple emergency room visits, uh, just more drugs and more drugs to control her pain. Um, because of she would not allow us into her doctor visits, we were not told what she was taking mm-hmm. or why she was taking it. Um, seniors sometimes don't realize that they are getting into big trouble. But if the family members aren't involved with the medical decisions, um, there's nothing we can do there. And if you could touch on... Um, Non-narcotic painkillers, why we, were, we weren't told about these and what they are. Um, and if the police and the courts could get involved to help the families when they know that there's abuse um, going on. And that's what I'll, I'll take, I'll listen offline. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks for sharing your story. Uh, yes, I'm very sorry to hear about your mother. Um, Yes, I mean, I think what, what, what we got, got into this question a little bit before, that we have a culture now of massively using pills for, for every problem. And not to say that, that some of those uh, medicines uh, uh, were, were necess- weren't necessary. I, I, perhaps they were. I'm not, I'm not your, I wasn't your mother's doctor. But um, it does seem to me that we have focused in, uh, so much on use of pills at, at the exclusion of other approaches. Um, more of under the wellness rubric, you know, like a, a better diet, more exercise, swimming. I find swimming, as part of this book, I have to say, I began to think I need to be the change I want to see in America, you know. I stopped drinking sugary sodas, uh, sugary teas and all that stuff. Uh, I, I stopped buying all, all food that's advertised on TV, because we all know that's junk. Uh, I began to, to work out more. Um, and, and I think that, that this is kind of part of, I have to say, this is part of one of the lessons that I take from, from this experience over the last 20 years we've had in America of that, 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 that we all need to be owners of our own wellness and, and looking at consumer uh, our choices and looking at the labels and, 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 and making sure that we don't eat too much processed sugar, that kind of thing. You know. David in Glendora, California, uh, just a couple minutes left. Can you make it quick? Yes, uh, my name is uh, David uh, Dower, uh, a doctor of chiropractic and acupuncture both. Uh, I've been working with opioids for a long time, opioid addiction. Uh, the easiest way to handle it is simply get rid of the pain. You need to go to a chiropractor to get your back fixed and, and your pain syndrome fixed. If you um, miss that and get addicted, then the acupuncture works better because I used to do it for pennies on the dollar. Uh, but the real uh, uh, situation is we need to get the central nervous system to work better on almost any condition you want to name out there, even in infectious diseases, because it's all about the immune system. When you get the immune system working right, you don't have any of the nonsense you're hearing that in these programs on TV all the time. And uh, we can do it in a very cost-effective manner. There's all kinds of seminal studies out there by, uh, for example, Richard Sarnat, S-A-R-N-A-T. Uh, look him up on the Internet. He- Got your point, David. Uh, yes, I'm not an expert in chiropractic medicine, but um, it does seem to me the overall point is uh, there are many ways of treating pain, and uh, we were working towards that. Pain specialists were working towards that kind of a more holistic idea of how to treat individual with the, the, the mystery of, of human pain. Um, and, and then uh, pills, narcotic painkillers kind of sucked up all the oxygen, as the cliche goes. You know, it just took over the entire... Uh, approach and I'm hoping that we can once again get back to a more holistic approach not that these again not that these pills don't have a role they absolutely have a role in modern medicine it's just not the only solution and I think what the what the doctor was just uh, alluding to was 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 that 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 there are a lot of approaches uh, to to pain and we ought to be uh, insurance companies ought to be reimbursing for them all and we ought to be um, making use of them all as, as we also pay very close attention to our own wellness and, and what we put in our bodies that, that add to this. And is this something you're going to be talking about with members of Congress that you meet with today? Uh, yes, what's sure, the, and, and, what's the and a little bit about how we got into this and why and, um, uh, you know, as, as some solutions as far as I see them. I'm a reporter, I'm not an advocate, I'm not an activist, I'm a storyteller, and so uh, try to kind of avoid that. But in, indeed, trying to talk with policymakers about 
uh, where they might go, perhaps. Uh, that's going to be part of what I'd say to them. And quickly, before the House comes in, is there a follow-up to this book planned? Are you going to go back to Dreamland? <laughs> uh, possibly. Uh, we'll see. I'm trying to write a story about uh, drug cartels next from Mexico. We'll see. Sam Quinones is the author of the book Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. We really do appreciate the time. Oh, today. my pleasure, John. Thanks very much. And now we're going to take our viewers live to the House floor, live coverage beginning gavel to gavel, of course, always on C-SPAN. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Eastern.